thank you all for coming out today. I know it's a little chilly and probably rather be back at the office. But um, this is a this week is an important milestone for us as we get ready to begin the Viaduct closure. Um, a lot of preparation has gone into getting to this point. Um, a couple of key messages that uh, I wanted to share with you all today as we get ready for this is um, there's some new videos that we've released today about getting around after the tunnel opens, and I think those are really important for travelers and, and folks that live and work downtown to understand that when we open up 99, it's going to look and feel differently than uh, it did when you used the viaduct. So that's an important message for people. And I think those videos are really informative and, and encourage people to take a look at that. And you all should do that. Uh, try to add that into your stories as you're um, talking about this over the next few days. Um, but most importantly, what we have starting Friday is the first of the closures uh, here at Royal Brougham. Uh, the on and off ramps into Soto will be closed at 10 o'clock on Friday night. Uh, there's about 23,000 vehicles per day that use these two ramps in, in total, and uh, those in, those folks that uh, work and live in Soto will be impacted. Uh, and so we're trying to get that message out to folks that plan, you'll need to plan alternate routes to get in and out of Z Soto, if you, particularly for folks that live in the north end. So the, the two ramps include the southbound off-ramp from the main line to South Atlantic Street. That ramp will close at 10 o'clock on Friday, and then the ramp right behind me, the Royal Brougham ramp uh, northbound, will close also at 10 o'clock on Friday. Um, there's a fair amount of work that we need to do in the coming week before the big closure starts on the 11th, and tackling some of that work this weekend and next week is paramount to getting ahead of and dealing with some of the work that then starts on the 11th. And, uh, for example, we, we walked a lot of you through the tunnel a few weeks back and we talked about removing all that geofoam that's underneath the main line. Well, that geofoam is part of the on-ramps is also underneath this current temporary on-ramp. So starting to tackle some of that work, closing this ramp, um, we can actually expose, remove that geofoam, and then we can start building some barrier. We, there's some exposing of those walls that allow us to dowel in and begin the shot treating and, and permanent barrier work and permanent walls for the north and southbound on-ramps. So that work will get started. All of this is what we call sort of risk mitigation, meaning this is work that if we try to squeeze it into the three weeks, we'd probably um, be pushing ourselves a little bit, bit, bit hard at the end. And this gives us a little bit of flexibility. It also helps us in the event that we get some really cold weather, we get some snow, we have some potential uh, weather impacts. This work that we're tackling at these ramps allows us to kind of get ahead of that and, and ensure that we finish the closure in the three weeks that we've got allocated. So those are the big uh, takeaways I want everybody to, to, to get today. Um, I really encourage you to take a look at the videos. I think they're really informative and they'll help people learn about how they're going to use use the on and off ramps uh, to get into, uh, into Seattle. Okay, so one of the uh, one of the videos, the one that I managed to watch, says that the uh, Dearborn ramp will open a week or so after the tunnel opens. That's the less than you guys have said before. Is this is this a new estimate? Yeah, the well, the, the schedule is, is is in the contract is seven to ten days. That was that's the duration that we when we put this whole plan together a year or two ago. That was the duration, seven to ten days after the main line opened. Um, we've done a lot of work. We've had these closures on and off all summer. This work that we're doing uh, this week, this coming week, all of those things and the planning that's gone into it suggests that it, we could complete that work in more in this five to seven day range. But I want to say comfortably seven days a week is the time period it will take us after the main lines uh, open to finish this last piece, which is also right behind me. Is that, that's that northbound off-ramp for folks coming from West Seattle that are trying to get into downtown. That'll, t that'll take about an extra week. Now, you had mentioned the people, especially from the north end, need to change their ways. What are you expecting when everybody's forced to get off at South Spokane Street coming from the south end? 
Well, so for travelers from the north that work downtown and work and like to use the South Atlantic Street ramp, you're going to have to exit at Western Southbound, or you're going to end up in West Seattle. And so you need to be paying attention to the messaging, and you need to understand that next week um, that we don't want folks to suddenly find themselves at West Seattle when they were trying to get to the stadium district. So uh, the message to folks is take Western and then navigate down the, through the waterfront to get there. Isn't impacted as much because these these uh, because the ramps are really focused on the north end. So folks that live in West Seattle won't really be impacted by what's happening next week, unless they work in Soto and then are trying to maybe use this ramp behind me to get further into the city. So those are kind of some things to pay attention to. Any other questions? So this ramp you're going to close, but then you're going to use that time to make it into a ramp to go into. Right. right, yes, so the ramp, uh, the northbound, permanent northbound on-ramp into the tunnel, as well as the, the tunnel ramp that comes out southbound, is buried underneath this, the ramp that's right behind me. And so when we close that ramp, we can start actually, we can take up the asphalt, we can dig out that dirt, we can expose the styrofoam that was buried, we can do all that work, and we can start marching our way south to north. When the main line then closes the... Um, that crosses over that ramp closes, then we could take, that's what starts on the 11th, we could take, continue to march north and move all of that geofoam and then expose uh, the, the roadway that was built by STP years ago and then build the barrier and build the walls underground. I know the new videos focus on after the tunnel. Correct. Right. During the three weeks or so that we have to deal without that, do you guys have any kind of alternate routes or anything? Yeah, certainly that's part of our messaging is that folks understand that they need to access downtown differently during the closure, uh, whether they choose to use I-5 or city streets, or, you know, more than anything, we really want people to think about uh, their discretionary travel, whether they really need to, to use those routes in those particular times of days. So we're talking a lot to employers and, uh, and folks that work downtown about uh, teleworking or stretching your schedule around so that you can um, not impact the, the 7 a.m. commute, the 4 p.m. commute out of town. If folks can do that, then the routes that are, the conventional sort of backup detour routes that people take, like I-5 and the city streets, will still have functionality if we can all sort of chip in and, and adjust our schedules accordingly. Prepare for the worst? Yeah, I, I don't want to say the worst. I don't want to, I don't want to say it's going to be that. In 2016, I wouldn't have characterized it for a lot of people, um, but there certainly were people that were caught off guard, and we want to encourage people to pay attention, look at the website, and get a feel for how you're going to get around during the closure, because if you use 99 today, you're going to be impacted, and if you use I-5 today, those 99 travelers will be trying to use I-5, and, and those folks need to understand that they're going to have to give themselves extra time to get to town. Yeah, well, that's where I'm counting on all of you to help us. Uh, that's why you're all here, is because we're you guys are the stewards of getting the message out to folks. And you know, some of the things I just said are so important. If travelers don't give themselves extra time to get downtown, um, you're going to miss appointments. You're going to be late to work. Those are. It's not that you can't get downtown. I'm not going to ever advertise that. What I think we need to tell people is what we saw in 2016 was that it took longer to get downtown. Some commutes actually took twice as long, uh, say from Bellevue to Seattle, actually took twice as long because the impacts of 99 closure actually uh, uh, materialized on some of the east-west corridors. So we really want folks to just give themselves extra time. It's not that you can't get downtown. You just need to pack some patience and be ready for a longer commute. Or adjust your schedule and keep your commute at the same time, but just use, use the different time of day to do it. Has Washington communicated with tech groups like Google to make sure that when this does close, it'll automatically show up on the GPS rather than somebody has to program that in when they yeah. notice that they can't get Yeah, a lot of that coordination is done by SDOT. SDOT's been talking to the Googles of the world to make sure that, that Waze and the, the, the systems that we all use to get around are up and ready uh, day one. The closure of Atlantic over here, the uh, I-5 and I-90, 
the signage up here on Western to send people to I-5? Well, so that's what we're going to encourage people is to, to, to use I-5. If you're trying to get to I-90, which we traditionally come down 99 and then cut over, we don't want you to do that. We want you to go use I-5 or use, uh, use Western, find a way through the city to get to I-99. That's a very good point. <coughs> Anything else? How ready are you for the big closure? Well, I think we're very ready. I mean, there's been a lot of planning, and I know there was an interest in October to really try to push and see if we could do it then. Um, there's been a ton of work to get the tunnel ready, of course, a lot of planning, a lot of coordination with the city, the county, um, just planning, people getting ready and planning their, their commutes, uh, I think, even for us personally, has... We've, we had a little extra time to do that. So I think we're definitely ready for this. Uh, you know, I guess, again, the risks are weather. A little bit nervous about a, a long, sustained uh, period of snow. I think we can handle that. Um, handle a lot of rain. And we can handle the snow if, you know, um, we're, we're actually asking the contractor to be ready for some concrete work with blankets and heaters and those types of things. Um, I'd, be, I'd just be worried if, if it lasted for a week. That would be a big problem for us. Um, that would push the schedule. But a little bit of weather, a little bit of snow probably won't affect us much. Well, that brings up my follow-up. With that weather and those concerns in mind, any concern at all that the February 4th date might not be met for the time? Yeah, so first of all, that's our goal is February 4th. Uh, we're talking about opening this tunnel in early February. Uh, our goal is after the grand opening events on the weekend of the 2nd and 3rd that we would open it up uh, that night. Um, Again, weather's, weather's always a risk, and if we had a sustained period of really, really lousy weather, and I mean like snow, 30 degrees and below uh, type of weather, that would probably impact our schedule if it lasted for more than a, a day or two. Usually we have a, a day or two of snow in Seattle every winter, so we can handle that, but if it happened for, if it went on for a week or more, that would be a problem in terms of making that February schedule. Is the suggestion for folks who typically use this ramp to take I-5 and go south to head north on 99 or just to avoid 99 altogether? Well, certainly we don't want people to come down into Sodo and then try to get on here. They'll be circling the block that we're standing on. So we're asking those folks to use I-5 or to use, if you're going somewhere else in downtown, use 4th or use another route. Um, sometimes people, I know people live in Sodo that actually jump on this ramp and then jump off at Seneca. Not going to be able to do that. You need to use first. You need to go up the Alaskan Way Boulevard, go up the waterfront that way. So um, that's a small minority of folks that do that, but there are people that use this just jump one exit. So uh, we'll in. with all your help, we can get that message out that these are closing. A lot of good work's going to happen that next week here. You guys will all be invited out uh, uh, both this coming Friday and then uh, early next week. We'll do some more media briefings with you all, kind of show you the progress of the work. Um, but yeah, plant, if you if you live in Soto or you work in Soto, it'll be a little more challenging to get in and around Soto. So you'll be you have to use other routes. So the, the ramps on the north end by the north side of the tunnel are not closing right now? That's correct. Yep. They'll all stay open. And then are you putting in a traffic light at Harrison? Uh, yeah, so the question is are we putting a traffic light in at Harrison? There is a traffic light at Harrison. It's not, it's currently bagged. That will open after we open the tunnel on February 4th. So that so east-west traffic on Harrison uh, will return after 60 years of being closed. So thank you all for coming. I want to point out something. Over here, if you see this geophone right here, that is part of the on-ramp that, that um, Dave was talking about. So you can actually get a peek at that. It's, yeah. it's under so yeah, yeah if you look at that real close, you can actually see the concrete right there. That's actually the part of the permanent uh, ramp into the tunnel. So you can see the angle. So you'll, you'll come to this intersection and you'll immediately kind of dive down and quickly enter into the tunnel right at this location. And so that's what we're going to remove there. We're going to start moving that, those white blocks of geofoam. It's a styrofoam product. We'll remove those. We'll take all that dirt, that geotextile fabric, the asphalt, all that temporary barrier. That'll all start coming out in earnest at 10 o'clock on Friday night. All right. All right thank well, you, thank everyone, you guys. for coming out.